All right. Hello. Um, hi. It's lovely to be here. Um, and, and thank you for having me. It's always great to speak at Aaron Swartz Day uh, and always bittersweet as well. Um, today, I, I thought I would talk about a book that I've just published. It's a book called Choke Point Capitalism that I co-wrote with uh, an Australian copyright scholar and activist named Rebecca Giblin, who teaches at the University of Melbourne. And the impetus for this book is that both of us had spent decades fighting in the copyright wars, um, as have many of you. And we had noticed that over 40 years, the scope of copyright had gotten uh, wider, the term of copyright had gotten longer, the statutory damages for uh, violating copyright had gotten harsher, and the ease of proving copyright infringement and taking advantage of those um, uh, statutory damages had only increased. And that uh, after 40 years of this, the entertainment industry was bigger and wealthier and more profitable than it had ever been. But the actual creative workers who did the work that generated the profits for those large firms, they were getting a dwindling share of the revenue from their work, both in real terms and proportionately, creators were getting poorer. And we asked ourselves, how is this possible? How is it possible that we expand copyright, we give it to creators, it is used to generate income, but that income doesn't go to the creators. And we realized that it had to do with the structure of the industry, that the industry being dominated by a few large firms meant that giving uh, entertainment uh, workers, creative workers, more copyright was like giving your bullied, kid, uh, your bullied school kid more lunch money. It doesn't matter how much lunch money you give your bullied school kid, uh, the bullies are just going to take it. And, you know, if the bullies are out there campaigning for more lunch money for the poor bullied school kids who are going hungry, giving your kids more lunch money will not induce those bullies to let them keep it. They'll just take whatever it is you give your kids and they'll take it off of them. And so while Congress and the various parliaments around the world have been giving creators more uh, rights that they can bargain with, they've been forced to bargain those rights away. And it wasn't just at the entertainment companies that they had to do this. You know, the other thing that had happened for the 20 years that we'd been involved in the copyright wars is that creative workers and their supporters and their fans had been asked to choose. Either you choose teen tech or teen content and you root for them. And you hope that as this uh, epic battle goes on in which these two giants wrestle with one another, that if you choose the right one, that they'll reward your loyalty once they've emerged victorious by dribbling a few more crumbs for you and your fellow supporters. Um, and we thought that this was a, a false choice, not just because it excluded the possibility that you could be on team artist as a separate team from tech or content, but also because it posed that tech and content that these two giants were themselves opposed to one another. And we didn't think that that was the case. Now, I have to give you a spoiler alert here because I'm about to give away the ending of a 70-year-old George Orwell novel. So if you haven't read Our Animal Farm, you might want to skip to later in the stream. But assuming that you don't mind and assuming that maybe you've watched it, in Animal Farm, the farm animals stage a revolution. They overthrow the oppressive farmer who runs their farm. They take it over, led by the pigs. But at the end of the novel, again, this is the spoiler, the pigs sell them out. They sell them out to the men. And the pigs and the men have a dinner together in the farmhouse. And the animals crowd around the window and they look from the pigs to the men and the men to the pigs and they can't tell the difference. It turns out that it doesn't matter if the giant company that controls access to your audience is, made, is a tech company or an entertainment company. It turns out that uh, whichever kind of company they are, they will take as much from the creative workers who produce the work as they can get away with because tech is not exceptional. Tech is not run by people who are exceptionally smart nor by people who are exceptionally evil or exceptionally virtuous. Tech is just doing what it has to do. So when tech was an upstart, when it was a new entrant, it treated creators better because it had to, to lure them away from the entertainment industry. Once it gained dominance, once it had a choke point, that's the choke point in choke point capitalism, it took advantage of those creators and took as much as they could from it. The advent of an internet composed of five giant websites filled with screenshots of text from the other four did the same thing to creative workers that the advent of a music industry composed of three giant record labels that own the three giant 
uh, music publishers that between them controlled controlled 60% of the recordings or 70% of the recordings and 60% of the compositions in the world. It uh, treated those creators as um, pockets to be picked. We wrote this book because we thought we could aspire to more than crumbs. We could aspire to more than just the leavings that came from uh, these two giants when they wrestled with one another. And so we decided to tackle that. So in the first half of the book, we try to unwind how the different scams of the different giant tech companies and entertainment companies work. And the reason that you have to unwind them is that they are very, very complicated. And they're very, very complicated, not because uh, they're, they um, uh, have to be, but because making them very complicated makes them hard to understand. You may have noticed as you move about the world that some things are hard to understand because they're complicated, but some things are complicated so they'll be hard to understand. That kind of arrangement, complicated so it'll be hard to understand, it actually has a name in the finance industry. Uh, finance bros call that MEGO, M-E-G-O, and it stands for My Eyes Glaze Over. Any prospectus or commercial arrangement designed to be so dull that people just go, Ugh, I can't even bring myself to read it. I'll just assume it's fine. Um, so the first half of this book is unwinding some of these MIGO arrangements. And I'll give you an example of one of them that we that we take on, and that's Spotify. So you may have heard lots of uh, uh, dueling things about Spotify. You may have heard that Spotify pays uh, an enormous amount of its revenues to uh, license labels. You may have also heard, or license music rather, you may have also heard that musicians get incredibly small amounts of money from Spotify. You may have heard that Spotify is a tech company that takes advantage of creators, and you may have heard that Spotify is, a, is an entertainment company that's owned by the labels. And the fact is that all of those things are true. And understanding how all of those things can be true goes a long way to understanding the thesis of choke point capitalism. So uh, the, there are three major record labels. Uh, they control 70% of the recordings in the world and 60% of the, of the compositions. And they got that way not by investing in those recordings. They got that way by buying up other labels at fire sale prices uh, in the early years of the copyright wars when Napster was dealing body blows to them uh, and they were looking for suitors. The reason they were able to buy and, and roll up all of those firms is that for the last 40 years, since the dawn of the neoliberal era, we've had enormous forbearance for uh, firms engaging in anti-competitive mergers, in merging with their competitors. This is everywhere we look, but especially in tech. You know, think of companies like Google. Google is a company that has invented one good search engine, a pretty good Hotmail clone, a browser that's pretty good, even though it spies on you like crazy, and nothing else. Everything else Google has done that has been successful, they bought from someone else. Everything they've done in-house, including things that competed with those other firms, they bought, uh, they, that, it, it failed. So Google made Google Video, it failed. They bought YouTube, it was a success. Their ad tech stack, their mobile stack, their server management tools, wherever you look at Google, from their mobile platform uh, all the way down to their HR tools, you find them buying other companies and using their tools. That's something that would have been historically prohibited before the Reagan era. It's something that is uh, permitted now, and it, that's the phenomenon that allowed these three giant record labels to become three giant record labels. Now, the fact that there's only three giant record labels means that there is no hope of launching a service like Spotify unless you're willing to do a deal with them and they're willing to do a deal with you. So a condition of those three labels allowing Spotify to come into existence was that first, Spotify had to give all of them equity. So they all owned a giant piece of Spotify. Now, one of the things that they negotiated with Spotify was an extremely low per stream rate. So when Spotify played the compositions by uh, Sony uh, artists, or, uh, or rather the recordings by Sony artists, by uh, Universal artists, or by Warner artists, they paid a very, very small amount of money for each of those streams. But the th big three labels also negotiated a minimum monthly rate from Spotify for, from, uh, for each of them. Now, if you've got a very low per stream rate, but a guaranteed monthly, it means that when you add up all of the streams that have been played on Spotify from, say, Warner, it might only come out to half of the millions and millions of dollars that Spotify owes Warner at the end of the month. So Warner knows who that half goes to. They, they've got the list of all the artists that were played. 
But then um, they've got this other half of the money, and it's not necessarily owed to any artist. Uh, in fact, maybe they can give it to themselves or pay them bonuses or give it to artists who they are trying to lure in at the expense of other artists. It's theirs to play with. It's unattributed royalties. Now, the other thing the labels were able to do because they were part owners of Spotify and because Spotify couldn't exist without their say-so is they could negotiate what's called a most favored nation clause, which means that no one was allowed to be paid more than them when their streams were played on Spotify. So for the 30% of independent musicians and labels that aren't owned by Sony, Warner, and Universal, the rate that they got paid was set by um, uh, Sony, Universal, and Warner at a much lower rate. Now, this is one of the ways that copyright can give large firms advantages over creators. The fact that uh, all of these copyrights lasted for 90 years and that once they were signed away, they were signed away forever, meant that the three labels could build up these huge portfolios of copyrights and that those uh, portfolios would allow them to design the future of their own, their own industry and furthermore design it so that um, anyone who really wanted to make music probably had to sign a deal with them which would give them even more copyrights which would also last for 90 years which they could use to design the future of the future of their industry and it meant that by structuring it they could ensure that there were never new market entrants that had to um, uh, that were uh, able to give a better deal to the creators that were signed to them because those new entrants just couldn't even get started without doing a deal with Sony, Warner, and Universal first. They had the choke point. So when Spotify went public, the label's shares all popped. Uh, they popped in part because um, they had artificially suppressed the cost of running Spotify. They had made it very cheap to run Spotify by uh, making low per stream rates. So Spotify can, on the one hand, be giving a lot of, of its monthly revenue to the labels and the artists, but that could still be a very small amount of money, and that small amount of money could still be not very uh, not uh, turning into much money for those artists. That is how these Baroque accounting scams all work, and it produces these horrific, seemingly intractable, and, and really hard to understand arrangements where um, uh, artists are asked to either point the finger at labels or at tech. But again, when you look from the pig to the men and the men to the pig, you find that um, they're indistinguishable from one another. Now, the first half of the book does this for all kinds of different uh, tech and entertainment company arrangements. Um, you know, it does it for uh, Audible, it does it for Amazon, um, it does it for all of the, 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 uh, the tech firms, including the ad tech stack and how they relate to the news media and so on. But for the second half of the book, we tackle solutions, um, really technical, shovel-ready solutions. We did not want to write one of those chapter 11 books where you've got 10 chapters explaining what's wrong with the world and an 11th chapter that says, well, we're out of time now. Um, obviously, this needs to be fixed. Everyone go out and vote harder. Instead, we wanted to describe uh, how you would unwind these choke points, how you would slow down the anti-competitive flywheel. Now, these systemic solutions uh, are not individual. Uh, we don't think that individuals can solve these problems uh, for the same reason that giving your kid more lunch money can't get them fed. Uh, and we shopped this book around to a bunch of different editors, and we had one very memorable call. We had an editor who said, you know, I really like this book. Um, I enjoyed it so much, but I can't buy it because the second half of the book has all of these systemic solutions. And our readers, they're individuals, and they're going to feel very frustrated when they learn that there's nothing individually that they can do to solve this. And we're like, dude, you are so close to getting this. Uh, but, you know, trying to shop your way out of monopoly is like trying to recycle your way out of climate change. You need to make systemic changes, not individual behavioral ones. And there are lots of inflection points at which systemic changes are possible. There are moments in which the arrangements become so manifestly unfair that lawmakers, regulators, um, or uh, um, uh, inst international institutions or rights bodies sit down to actually make a difference. Sometimes judges hand out orders, sometimes regulators enter into settlements. And when that happens, having these ideas lying around, these detailed technical proposals for how you can actually address this is going to be really important. 
because right now, whenever it comes time to do something, we end up engaging in what um, uh, Bruce Schneier calls the, the security syllogism, which goes, something must be done. No, well, there I've done something. I guess we're done. Um, without any regard to whether the thing you've just done has any chance of actually addressing the issue that you care about. So when the next time comes around that someone is saying, well, maybe we should mandate copyright filters, that's something that's coming up before uh, the Copyright Office in Congress soon. Or when someone says, well, we need to do something about the uh, news media and its failing fortunes that's coming up in Canada right now, uh, and also possibly in the US Congress in the, uh, in the lame duck session. And we say, well, look, you know, these ideas, they, they, they start from the right proposition that we need to do something about these manifestly unjust systems, but they, where they come to doesn't actually address it. In fact, it might just make it worse. So I'll take you through a few of these uh, different proposals and how um, they could work. So the first one is copyright termination. Uh, in the 1976 Copyright Act, there was originally a clause that said 25 years after any copyright assignment contract, the copyright reverts back to the author. Doesn't matter if you signed a contract that says you're signing away the copyright forever, 25 years after you've signed it, it comes back to you. And the person you assign the copyright to has to find you and say, look, we would like to continue exploiting this copyright. Please, would you let us do so? And if the copyright is valuable, you might be able to say to them, all right, fine, but uh, I'd like some more money. I'd like a better deal. It's often the case when people negotiate their contracts at the beginning of their careers, they don't have a lot of negotiating leverage. Now, the way that that eventually played out was nowhere near as, as uh, powerful as, as it could have been. Today, if you want to uh, terminate your copyright, you can do so after 35 years. And, excuse me, and the paperwork is very complicated. Um, if you go to the Authors Alliance, which is a nonprofit that I volunteer on the advisory board for, we can help you out. We've got some tools to make it easier. And some authors and other kinds of creators have made really good use of that termination clause. Uh, if you've ever bought a Sweet Valley High book or a Babysitter's Club book for a kid in your life, um, you're buying it direct from the author. The authors have terminated those copyright transfers and uh, they're getting a really good deal on it. Uh, Stephen King terminated the transfers on his early books when he was just Stephen King, a guy writing his first novel and not Stephen King, one of the best-selling authors on earth. He got a much worse deal than he could get today. And so he got a new deal. Dean Coots did it too. Um, the person who made the game of life, not Conway, uh, the, the computer thing, but uh, the person who made it for Hasbro, trying to terminate that. Uh, the heirs of the, uh, the people who created characters for Marvel are serving termination on Disney and, and currently involved in a huge sprawling battle that includes the estate of Stan Lee, which is pretty wild to watch un unroll. But the most interesting example of this is George Clinton, who had his copyright stolen from him by a, a forged, uh, term, a forged um, transfer. And for years and years, he sued the person who had forged his signature to get his copyrights back. And it was impossible. Uh, that person had all the money from his copyrights and he didn't. And so eventually after decades of this, he said, you know what, let's just pretend I did tr transfer this to you. I'm gonna terminate it now. And away he went, he got his copyrights back. The reason George Clinton is still touring is not just because he's an unstoppable funk machine, it's because he's broke, because he had all this stuff stolen from him. So termination can do really well and we can make it easier, we can make it automatic, we can make it happen after shorter periods. And then there's transparency rights. So if you're a, a creator that has a royalty arrangement for your copyrighted works, uh, so you get paid a little every time one of your works sells, um, your studio or label or publisher probably gives you the right to audit them. It's expensive, but creators do it sometimes individually or sometimes through their organizations. The Science Fiction Writers Association does it once a year for one of their members. They pick them at random and they go and they audit for them. And, and if you go and you perform that audit, you will probably find some accounting irregularities. Uh, we cite uh, one uh, firm in Los Angeles that uh, specializes in auditing royalty arrangements for record labels. And they've done tens of thousands of these over many decades. And what they found is that in every instance, except one, when they find an accounting error, it is in the favor of the label or the studio or the publisher and not in the artist's favor. Now we have no explanation for this. All I can assume is it's some kind of horrible localized probability storm. But when those creators find that they've been stolen from, through accounting tricks, and they demand the money that they're owed, the publisher, the label, the studio will likely say, 
you know, I think you're mistaken. You just don't understand how our books work. But because we're such good-natured slobs, we don't want any bad blood between us. We'll offer you a settlement, some fraction of what you think you're owed. But as a condition of receiving that money, you have to agree to a non-disclosure agreement so that you can't tell anyone else how we stole your money. You especially can't tell anyone else who we stole money from how we stole your money. Oh, and also, your auditor has to agree that they can never audit us again. Right? Imagine if you could say, well, well, we'll agree to be audited by only auditors, but only by auditors that have never caught us cheating before. It's like uh, if you're accused of doing a murder and the forensics team shows up and you say, you know, guys, I'm so glad to have you here. Dig up any part of my backyard you want looking for bodies, but um, I'm going to have to insist that you don't dig in that back corner. Uh, that's a corner I'm very sentimental about. I'm sure you understand, but dig anywhere else you like. So these non-disclosures represent an enormous barrier to creators getting paid. When a creator discovers that they've been robbed and they get some money back, we had one source who had a six-figure error in their favor that they discovered this way. If they could tell other creators where the money is hidden, every creator would benefit from it. Now, funny thing about monopolies, they are very concentrated. So almost all of these royalty contracts are consummated in California and New York, Washington State, you know, you've got Amazon and some big games companies, and Tennessee because of Nashville. And contract, of course, is a creature of state law. So if each of these states were to pass a short bill that said, as a matter of public policy, non-disclosure is not enforceable where it pertains to uh, audits of uh, royalty statements that surface material omissions or errors that redound to the negative uh, finances of someone who is owed a royalty for creative work. Those short bills, four short bills, in fact, any one of them, would put more money in the pockets of more creators than all the copyright term extensions of the last 40 years. It's like a crack in the machine that if you insert a crowbar into it and wriggle it around, money pours out of the machine and into the pockets of working artists all around the world. So transparency can do a really good uh, job for creators. And let me just check the time here. I think I've got another 15 minutes. So I'm going to give you another example of how um, we can do transparency to make a big deal out of this, to, to make more money for creators. So I'm going to tell you a little about Audiblegate. You probably know that Amazon has a division called Audible that is the most successful audiobook company in the world. They're a monopolist. They have about 90% market share in, in most genres. Very, very powerful buyer of creative works. Right? If you're a seller of creative works, an author, you really have to use Audible. And if you don't, you're going to be screwed. There's no, no one's going to be able to find your work. Now, the thing is, if you do, you're also going to be screwed because Audible knows that they're the only game in town and they act like it. So uh, we in the book document a very enraging phenomenon called Audiblegate. And Audiblegate was the discovery of Audible authors all around the world, independent authors who use Audible's ACX platform. That's the Audible Content Exchange. It's a self-serve platform for small publishers, independents. And the way that it works is you go in and you, you find a narrator. They help hook you up with narrators. You pay the narrator. You enter into a royalty share arrangement. To make an audiobook, you put it on ACX. Um, back when all this started, even though you paid for the work, um, ACX required that you not make that work available anywhere else for seven years, uh, even though you had financed it. And then Audible sells it for you. And Audible has two kinds of customers. They've got the customers that they don't like very much, which are the ones who just pop in and buy an audiobook every now and again. And then they've got the customers they love, which are the ones that have recurring subscriptions. Because recurring subscriptions make, the, make Audible a powerful buyer. And it gives them a lot of power over the industry. Because if, if you're getting a credit every month from Audible, you're going to come back to Audible every month. You're not going to go shop somewhere else. You've already paid for your credit on Audible that month. And so they want to make those recurring subscribers very happy. And so if you listened to an ACX audiobook, when you were done, you would be prompted, you would be encouraged to return that audiobook as unsatisfactory. You might have listened to it three times. You might have listened to it six months ago and kept it in your library. But Audible would send you messages in the app. They'd send you emails and they would say, you know, if you didn't like that book, you can return it. You can return it for a full credit and get another book. You don't have to wait till next month. What they were doing is they were making those subscriptions more valuable. Now, Audible pays a royalty to whichever author you buy your audiobook from with your credit every month. But if you return that book, 
Audible doesn't have to pay you the royalty. They get to claw it back. So what they were effectively doing was saying, hey, subscriber, why don't you listen to three audiobooks this month? And they were saying to the uh, independent creators, why don't you pay, subsidize us while we give two free audiobooks every month? to uh, our audience to get them to maintain their subscriptions, to make those subscriptions more valuable. Uh, and, and they were saying it, but they were saying it very quietly. It was buried in some fine print and the creators didn't really know what was going on. They would see these royalty statements that said, you have sold five books. And what they wouldn't know was that what they'd actually done is sold 15 books, but 10 had been returned because Audible didn't break out their royalty statements. Now, one day there was an error and three months worth of returns were booked against their sales all in one go. And the creators woke, woke up and figured out what was going on. Uh, a writer in Perth, Australia named Susan May kicked off this campaign to get Audible authors a better, uh, a better uh, deal. It was called Audiblegate. And Audible authors all around the world found each other via this hashtag. One of them was a British author, Colleen Cross, who's a retired forensic accountant who now writes mystery novels about accounting fraud. She was the right person to go and have a deep dive on this. And what she found was that they weren't just clawing back one credit from you when a listener returned a book. Sometimes they were doing two or three. And what's more, they weren't calculating the royalties the way they said they were. All in all, Colleen Cross reckons that there were hundreds of millions of dollars in accounting fraud. Now, why didn't the IC ACX authors just quit over this? Well, one reason is that the listeners can't quit Audible. Every Audible book is non-negotiably sold with DRM on it. And since it's against the law to remove DRM, even if the rights holder authorizes you to do it, your listeners can't quit Audible and follow you to a rival platform, even if you decide that you don't want to stay there anymore. And even if you tell them that, that it's cool with you, if they convert those Audible files to an MP3 or some other format. Um, and so uh, those authors were locked in because the creators were locked in. Now, the Audible authors clubbed together. Once they knew what was going on, once there was some transparency, they clubbed together, they campaigned, their listeners joined them, and they and they got better accounting deal, and they got an end to this seven-year exclusivity with, solid, with their solidaristic action. It wasn't perfect, it wasn't enough, but it was an enormous start, and it shows you how even very atomized and vulnerable authors can use transparency and solidarity to get a better deal. Now, none of my books are available on Audible, and this book isn't available on Audible, except that we did package up just the chapter on how Audible rips off artists, and we put it on Audible as an Audible exclusive. So if you are one of those people who subscribes to Audible, you can go ahead and you can download it. You can return it when you're done. It's fine with me. Um, but if you want to get the audiobook, we kickstarted an independent edition of it. It's for sale everywhere that isn't Audible, which is a lot of places that honestly most people don't use, but we could use. It's not going to fix the Audible problem, but it will do a little bit. Again, this is not a, an individual issue. This is a systemic issue. Uh, we sell it at Google Play and at Downpour at Libro.fm. I've got my own audiobook store, craphound.com slash shop. Um, or, or you can you can just listen to that chapter in Audible and return it when you're done. So solidarity got the Audible authors pretty far. And solidarity is really important. Uh, uh, one of the stories we tell in the book is about Taylor Swift. So Taylor Swift is a very important recording artist. She's really structurally important to the labels right now. And all of the labels really want her business. Universal Music courted her very aggressively and they said, please come and become one of our artists. And Taylor Swift said, I will, but here's what I want from you. You're about to get billions of dollars when you sell your Spotify shares. And you um, have said that you might share some of that money with the artists, but you haven't said how you're gonna share the money with the artist. We're all pretty sure that you're not gonna do it fairly because what you have right now is this circumstance where all these people who have universal music deals have been paid in advance uh, for uh, production of their music and, and, and to live off of while they, while they record their album. And then they've had an expenses, uh, expenses um, racked up against that advance. So that's things like the cost of the studio, the engineer, the publicity, um, you know, the champagne at your launch party will be billed to your account. And you get a little royalty every time one of your record sells or your MP3s or your streams. And that money is credited to that account that uh, has the debt from your album. And, you know, at the rate that it goes, even if you make millions of dollars, you might not pay off the hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt that you owe to your label. And Taylor Swift said, 
we're all pretty sure that when you uh, share the, the money from this um, Spotify IPO with your artist, that what you're actually going to do is just credit it to their debt account so that they uh, end up still owing you money that they will never pay off, but the fictional debt that they owe you that they'll never pay off will be slightly lower than it was before. And she said, I demand that if you want me to be a universal music star, that you're going to have to actually just give those uh, creators, every creator signed to Universal Music, cash money. Not a credit against their account, but money that they can spend on groceries and rent, braces for their kids, healthcare, all the things that every worker needs. Now, solidarity is great, and it's really nice when powerful people use their position to help everyone out. But what we really need is solidarity beyond just a few headliners doing good for the people around them. What we really need is solidarity across all sectors, between artists, between uh, and and between artists and audiences, between artists and audiences and other kinds of workers, uh, with technologists and with other people who care about the future of the arts and the creative and our creative endeavor. So one of the stories we tell in this book is about Uber drivers in California, some of the most atomized workers in the world. Uh, Uber drivers were required to, with their click-through agreement, agree to something called binding arbitration. Binding arbitration means that if you get screwed over by Uber, you can't sue them. All you can do is get a, a corporate judge who works for Uber to hear your case. And if they decide that uh, Uber really did screw you, they can give you some money but it doesn't form a precedent. No one, no one else can use that judgment to get their own money. And uh, it's often covered by non-disclosure. So you can't tell anyone else how much money you got. So this is not great justice. So these Uber drivers in California had been ripped off by Uber. Uber had been stealing their wages. And they got together and they automated arbitration claims. And they filed thousands and thousands of arbitration claims. Now each arbitration claim has a service charge. They have to pay those fake judges. And it turns out that once you pay the fake judge to individually hear all of these cases by all of these drivers you screwed, you pay way more money than you would have if they just had a class action. Uber just never thought that they would do this. So when this uh, mass arbitration claim was, was filed, Uber was in the bizarre position of going to court and saying, Your Honor, what kind of idiot would think that this manifestly unfair arbitration clause could possibly be enforceable? Please let us wriggle out of it. But the court didn't let them wriggle out of it. And in the end, they offered $150 million to those drivers. Now, Uber drivers are in a choke point market, just like creators. You've got riders on one side who want rides. You've got drivers on the other side who want to give them rides. And in the middle, you've got Uber with a choke point that takes a rent every time you do this. Uber drivers and uh, other kinds of workers, like creative workers, we're on the same side, even if we don't know it. So at the end of the book, spoiler alert, we talk about uh, a great friend of the Internet Archive and a great friend of Aaron's, uh, James Boyle, who, along with Jennifer Jenkins, runs the Center for the Public Domain at Duke University. You probably know him from his annual uh, public domain reports, where he talks about what is in the public domain and what would be in the public domain uh, if copyright term extension hadn't happened in 76 and, and 98. And, and Jamie, in his books, he, he has this analogy, and I've, I know I've said this before at Aaron Swartz Day, and I've said it before at the Internet Archive, but I'm, I'm going to keep saying it because it's the thing that gives me hope. He says that before the term ecology was coined, people who worked on different issues didn't know that they were on the same side. It, if you cared about owls and I cared about the ozone layer, do we care about the same thing? Are birds and the atmosphere really related? Obviously, the term ecology turned a thousand issues into a movement. And today there are people who are being harmed by excessive corporate power all over the world in lots and lots of ways, buyers and sellers. And um, once we realize that we're all on the same side, once we realize that Uber drivers and public school teachers and cheerleaders who are stuck with the one cheerleading league and wrestlers who are stuck with the one wrestling league, people who are being screwed over by the hyper-concentrated finance sector, that we're all on the same side. Then we will have a movement that is so powerful that no one will be able to stop it. Then those systemic changes in the second half of the book, then we'll be able to implement them. So uh, once again, I'm, I'm really grateful. Oh, I do. Well, can we take some questions? I thought I had 40 minutes. Okay. 
Oh, no, not at all. So, no, no, that's great. So, you know, with that, I can we can move to questions. I think that it's um, uh, it's a good place to stop. And, and uh, I, again, I really appreciate the chance to speak with you guys at Aaron Sports Day. Uh, every year, it, it means so much to me to take this moment to not just remember Aaron, but to think about how we can honor his legacy. So I don't know how we want to handle questions, Lisa, is there, because uh, um, I don't have a video feed, but uh, if people want to put questions in, I can pull up that. Uh... And let them ask it. Oh, here we go. And then, okay. Yeah, I'm so in the live chat. So say what it is, and I'll say what it is, and I'll repeat it. That's what we do. Yeah. He can't hear that mic. Can, can I just? Yeah, it's sure. It's longer. Hey, so, Corey, this so is Corey, Brewster. Yeah, just to let you know, Brewster's here right now talking to you Excellent. on the Zoom. But, I um, hear Brewster. When we take people from the audience, I'm going to have to okay. repeat their question to you Excellent. after they say That's it. Fine. Okay, but here's All Brewster. right. Hi, Brewster. Okay. I feel like saying, Exodor, is that you? Go ahead. <laughs> Howdy. Um, so Hi. thank you for going and detailing with this important book, uh, Publisher Fuckery, towards uh, the uh, creatives that basically sustain them. Um, there's another area of publisher fuckery which has to do with how they... Um, they deal with their customers uh, mm -hmm. and the shifting from copyright to licensing is mm -hmm. just atrocious. And mm -hmm. um, I would love more of your thoughts on sort of what's going on there where copyright isn't even bad enough for these people. They mm -hmm. uh, went above and beyond with licensing. Um, Larry Lessig threw out something last time I saw him which I thought was kind of interesting, which he said, mm -hmm. Well, they should get copyright or licensing, mm. but not both. Hmm. And that would cause a choice. Um, but why do you, copyright is this an, annoyingly, it, it, it is a, a criminal offense, so you get czars of copyright. What the hell is a czar of copyright in the White House office uh, to go and uh, enforce whatever it is? Plus, there's licensing, which never expires, such that it never goes into the public domain, never has print disabled, never blah, 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 blah. So, you've addressed, thank you for the, mm -hmm. um, but you have more work to do, Corey. Um, sure. With the publisher fuckery going the other way, and the licensing yeah. aspect of how that makes it so that there can be these platforms, because there's monopoly structures built into these licensing structures. So, I think that this is a really good example of how uh, the distinction between the tech sector and the entertainment sector is very artificial because um, the tech sector really invented this licensing wheeze, right? It was the tech sector that, that invented the idea that um, you could, you could uh, unbox a piece of software or, uh, or just land on a website and without really any affirmative step from you, you could agree, agree, that you know you that the the counterparty could come over your house and punch your grandmother and make long distance calls and eat all the food in your fridge and you know um, uh, wear your underwear, and uh, it was the tech sector that went and fought the court battles that made those licensing arrangements, those absurd licensing arrangements, conscionable and possible, and the answer to this has got to be solidarity again. And the good news is that so many of us labor under onerous licensing conditions that a readdressment of how these licenses work and when they can be imposed and what the limits are on them is uh, something that with the, uh, if, we, if we bring in all of the other people who are being harmed by these unfair licensing arrangements, we can make a difference with. So, um, you know, take the, the right to repair fight. You know, John Deere tractor owners have been told by John Deere at the Copyright Office in 2017, you don't own your tractor. Um, you, you, you own the metal, but the software is licensed to you. And since without the software, the metal is just a boat anchor, then you don't own the tractor and you don't get to decide how you use it. When I um, was campaigning on HP printers, ripping people off on Printer Inc., they were pushing uh, fake security updates to HP printers that were called a security update, but what they actually did was update your printer so that it would no longer use third-party ink. They said, well, but it's in the license agreement that we can do this. It's, it's, you know, it's not really your printer, it's our printer. Um, 
there are so many people who are on the wrong end of these licenses. Think of those Uber drivers with their unconscionable uh, binding arbitration clauses that um, it, it seems to me that if you want to make a difference about this, you, you don't pick a fight about libraries and copyright because as important as that is to me and you, it's not important to enough people and it's not important enough to enough people to create a mass issue. But if we can gather all of the people who are subject to harms from these licenses, we can stop the absurd pretext that, you know, if, if someone were to have a shop that said over the over the threshold, you know, by entering the store, you, you agree I can punch you in the mouth. And then when they did, they said, well, you know, you agreed, you walked through the door. If we get rid of that absurd pretense and we get back to uh, a, a kind of fair rule of law based way of, of running our commercial arrangements within uh, and between sectors, including workers and end users, then the rest of it is just a rounding error. It's just it's just making sure that once we have that framework that we that we make sure that the deal that's offered to libraries is fair. But you know, the number of people who are angry about uh, licensing uh, badness in their uh, in their ebooks is much smaller than the number of people who should be angry about licensing badness in their coffee makers, their ovens, their cars, their HVAC systems. Um, you know, I have a I have a solar a solar array on the roof of my house. It stopped working because uh, the manufacturer designed it so that if we stopped sending them telemetry from it, it would cease to generate power from us. Uh, for six months, we've had no power from our very expensive solar array. All of these outrageous contractual arrangements uh, are, are creating constituencies for dealing with this issue that is important in the round uh, in much more ways than the mere issue of library ebooks, as important as that is to you and me. Yes, um, my question is about um, mandatory arbitration agreements. Can I ask Corey's thoughts on the 14th Amendment and how corporations have usurped that language to facilitate things like mandatory arbitration and avoiding antitrust laws? Yeah, yeah. So that was that was very well done. I felt like we were at either ends of like a, a radio relay at a remote scientific station in Alaska. All we needed was like you saying over at every uh, at every pass there. Um, so you know, the Fourteenth Amendment is the Equal Protection Clause. It's it's uh, a clause that was um, related to the uh, end of of slavery in America. Um, my understanding, and, and I've only been an American since July, so I don't pretend to be an American constitutional expert, um, but my understanding is that uh, right from the beginning, the 14th Amendment was being hijacked by uh, powerful corporate interests. But the, the you know, expansion of 14th Amendment doctrine into corporate personhood has really made things worse over and over again and continues to do so. So I think your point is well taken that the 14th Amendment, I don't, if it, I don't, I don't know that I would say that it's been usurped in my understanding. Uh, what's happened is that it was always a devil's bargain where you had a, a corporate personhood at the periphery, but that that corporate personhood has become ever more important. And I think that what it shows you is that um, the real politique of, of uh, constitutionalism, like like how the Constitution actually gets interpreted and uh, and how its its clauses are enforced, have a lot to do with power. That uh, when firms have a lot of money and power, they can mobilize that money and power to ensure that the interpretations that are enacted are favorable to them. So you know, corporate personhood is hypothetically it's a, it's a way to um, uh, separate companies from their shareholders and from their managers. But then you also have decisions like Hobby Lobby in which the owners of a, of a company, of a corporate person said, uh, although the corporate person is not us, and that's very important because it means that we have limited liability and so on, it is nevertheless kind of us. And since we're, you know, 
weirdo religious nuts who think that women shouldn't be allowed to have IUDs. We want our, uh, to, our company, which doesn't share our views uh, because it can't have views. Companies can't have views. They're not real people. We want our company to be able to have the constitutional right not to be forced to do something that is against our views. And you had this weird merger where the 14th Amendment applied if you were trying to sue Hobby Lobby, but not when Hobby Lobby was uh, being required to comply with other rules and was being um, asked to uh, uh, act in ways that a corporation could, even if an individual couldn't. And, and you know, that uh, uh, very convenient two-sidedness is not accidental. It is an epiphenomenon of concentrated corporate power, right? It is downstream of concentrated corporate power that corporate lobbies were filing uh, amicus briefs and backing Hobby Lobby in this in this venture. Um, and you know, there's an old joke that whose punchline is, "If you wanted to get there, I wouldn't start from here." We've had 40 years of forbearance for corporate power, starting in the Reagan era. Uh, and, and part of that is expressed in the way that we enforce antitrust law, but it's also enforced, it's also expressed in many other ways. And what we've done is we've allowed for dangerous concentrations of wealth and power in the hands of individuals and firms. And what that means is that we are now in a circumstance where it's very hard to get rid of them. You know, when companies are too big to fail and too big to jail, the 14th Amendment just doesn't matter as much because they can just play endless games with it. They can hire lawyers uh, uh, and outspend, outspend the U.S. government. You know, IBM, which is one of these firms that was too big to fail and too big to jail, spent 12 years in antitrust hell from 1970 to 1982. They called it Antitrust's Vietnam. And every single year for 12 consecutive years, the bill for the antitrust lawyers that IBM hired from outside firms was higher than the wage bill of all the antitrust lawyers working for the US Department of Justice, working on every antitrust case in America. That firm was too big to fail and too big to jail. And after 12 years, they wriggled off the hook. They were never enforced against in the way that the DOJ had been seeking to because they outspent the US government. So uh, we are now in a circumstance where we have to blunt corporate power in order to bring these other instruments to bear. You know, it, it, there's an analogy here to copyright. Copyright is, if, if there are dozens of publishers, you know, when I started selling books, there were about 20 publishers in New York. If there are dozens of publishers, you can use your copyright to bargain with them. You can say, well, you want too much of my copyright. I'll take this, this offer across the street and see if that other guy will give me a better deal. But now that there's only five publishers, we get a lot less value out of it. Uh, when there's only five publishers, they all offer the same terrible deal. Uh, and I think the same is true of the 14th Amendment, that when, the, when there are lots and lots of companies, the 14th Amendment can be enforced against them. When there's only a few, it's very hard to hold them to account. The problem isn't the 14th Amendment. The problem is the concentration of wealth and power. Over. Sure. Um, we won't name any names, um, but um, I have been in, not in such a situation myself, I wish, but I've had a lot of friends in the last few years that are shopping books, and they immediately feel like uh, not only the publishers, but their own agents and everyone along in the process is uh, sort of against them. They're kind of price fixing. Mm -hmm. the publishers give you this this deal that there it's all the same deal from all of them and it seems like the agents are in on it they're encouraging you to take the shitty deal well what not all of them you have a yeah. agent, for instance <laughs> sure but but i'm just saying it feels like oh sorry but i'm just saying it feels like you don't have a lot of choices when you mm -hmm. write a book um, and even if you're, this has always been true for small new authors, right? But now it seems like it's true for all authors. And what do you recommend? We have a lot of writers uh, in the audience, you know, and online around the world um, that are ready to self-publish because it seems like it's the mm -hmm. only thing out there, but then you don't have the distribution. You can put it up on Amazon. Yeah but you don't have the distribution. So what would you recommend to those people as a sort of a 
from the trenches. Well, I'm, I, I, I'm, af I'm afraid I might have to disappoint you here. So first I will say that I think that the um, agents by and large do want what's best for their clients. I, although we do talk about in the book about how the four Hollywood talent agents got cornered by private equity firms and, and started screwing over their, uh, the, the screenwriters who ground out a 22 month strike where all 7,000 screenwriters in Hollywood fired their agents and didn't hire them back for 22 months until the agents agreed that they would uh, prioritize their clients over their own uh, firms. But uh, I think that if agents are saying, well, you should take this crummy deal because it's the best you're gonna get, the reason for that is that it is the best you're gonna get, that this, this cornered market, this choke point market, doesn't have a lot of better deals available to creators. That's, that's, that's the problem here, and there's not much that individuals can do to fix it. It's the kind of thing that arts organizations should be working on. And arts organizations have got a kind of spotty track record on this. They, they have spent a lot of time chasing their tails on things like copyright filters or Google Book Search uh, instead of the things that actually make a difference, like cleaning up the ad tech market, blocking mergers, things that would actually make a material difference to the uh, lived experience of writers that would put groceries on their table and braces on their kids' teeth. The other reason though I have to disappoint you, and I'm sorry, is that everything I know about breaking into the field and what it's like to be a beginning author is 20 years old. That's how long it's been since I was in that position. So, you yeah. know, when I was a baby writer, I used to go to science fiction panels and I would hear writers tell stories about, you know, how uh, advising young writers on like how to sell a story to uh, John W. Campbell at Astounding. And the magazine hadn't been called Astounding for 15 years. John W. Campbell died the year I was born, and he was a fascist. Uh, and, um, and, and none of that advice was any good to anyone, right? It was a reminiscence disguised as advice. And, you know, the, the plight of uh, writers who are entering the field has never been uh, an easy one. And I think it's a materially worse one now. I think the evidence points to that. But the people best situated to help you get make the best of that bad situation are other writers who are at the start of their careers. And established writers, we don't know anything about what it's like to be selling your first book in 2022. Nothing. So I'm sorry, I wish I could give you a better answer. You were supposed to have the answer to everything, Corey. What I'm is, sorry, what is Lisa. this? <laughs> I'm okay, sorry. no problem. Hey, we do have one other uh, question for you. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, I was just going to resemble that as an older artist to tell younger people what to do a bit. What's your question? Um, so my, my experience was that if you value your own time and you say my time is worth X amount as an artist, putting in 50% of a production and they give you half of the, the rights and the money that comes in. Okay, if he can't hear you, remember, you're telling me your question yeah. so I can ask him. Okay, so I was, that was a comment on your discussion. Yeah, we're not gonna, he's not going to hear the comment. Oh, <laughs> What's okay. your question? Um, my question is, if you want to give away IP, I own the rights to the oldest magic encyclopedia in the world. It's almost 100 years old. And I just like to give that away to magicians. And so how do I prevent other people from monetizing it or translating it into Chinese and selling it because that's occurring? So oh, thank okay. you. So are you talking about, uh, she's talking about open sourcing, uh, open sourcing a book, for instance? It's Encyclopedia of Magic, actually. Encyclopedia of Magic. Okay, yes. but you put it out over an open source license and you're worried about other people monetizing it. How right. do you stop so other people? This is the age old Creative Commons question, Corey, that people have I mean, been asking it's for been 20 years. I translated into Chinese and I have no well, Right. I, I so mean, people are you, translating you, you it into other languages to... and selling it. Yeah. And, and she's so wondering what can we do. If you put it out under a commercial do? license, yeah, I think if you put it out under a commercial license, you are telling people to monetize it. So if you've, if you've, if, you, if you've used a commercial license with it, you're telling people to monetize it. I believe so it's I, not I, a commercial license. That's the point. Oh, so Putting they're violating out. your copyright. Yes, they are, but it... They're violating your license. I mean, then you just you just have to make the call, right? I mean, that's not, a, that's not specific to Creative Commons. No, no, no. I'm saying if I want to give it away and other people are monetizing it. Right. So she, she's saying, well, she gives it away and then other people are monetizing it. So when they do that, they're violating your copyright is what he's saying. And just like if actually, just like if you had a paid book that somebody translated in another language and sold in another country. And so That's right. the, the remedies, as they say, for that kind of thing, the legal term, 
are have never been that good, and this is something that we're asked a lot at Creative Commons, and and he's just saying, you know, you have to make that call whether you're going to try to get can, litigious about you it. You can sue. You can send them a takedown. You know, you got to. I mean, you have to do the same thing that you would have to do if you were a commercial publisher publishing a commercial book, and someone published an infringing edition. I mean, I I spend an hour a week. Uh, sending emails to Amazon asking them to take down commercial editions uh, of my books that I haven't authorized that people upload to the Kindle store. It's it's just part of the deal, um, you know, and you, you have to decide how much it's worth it to you to, to chase it uh, and whether you want to hire a lawyer and try and get some money out of them. Um, I think oftentimes the, the people who are who are doing these kind of, uh, uh, they're, often, they're often doing it very um, uh, indiscriminately they're, they're, they're just like grabbing thousands of texts that they find and, and making books out of them. They might not have much money at all, in which case you're not going to get anything. You know, you, the, even if you win, you won't get anything out of them. I mean, it's really, uh, uh, it's a choice you're going to have to make, but it's not related to uh, open publishing or not open publishing. This is a choice you have to make whether it's open publishing or not. You know, I, I um, went into a bookstore, my local bookstore, Dark Delicacies in LA, where they, they order books when people want signed copies of my books. Uh, they order them in and then you, you know, you, you send an email to them and you said like a copy of the book and then I pop in and they sign it and they send it off to you. And they said, oh, we've got some copies of your first novel down and out in the Magic Kingdom here. Would you like to come in and sign them? And I went in and I was like, what edition is this? I've never seen this before. And it was a pirate print edition being distributed by Ingram that was coming up higher in the catalog. Than the, than the Macmillan edition of my book, than the real edition of my book. It, I mean, it's not an open licensing issue. It, it, is, it is irrespective of how you license your book, you have to deal with this issue. Yeah. Anyway, it's, it's now okay. gone 8 o'clock here I really here appreciate, in yeah, thank, thank you, you so much for coming, Corey, and All right. good luck with everything, and we'll talk to you later. Thank you, bye. All right, good night, everyone. <laughs>